David? Jeff, you're coming in hot. We're going right, <clears throat> right to you. Uh, you get, uh, I get to introduce you. So I, I do want to thank you for um, what I know is, is time out of uh, a particularly busy week for you guys um, as president of the Greenville Drive. For those of you who don't know, know Jeff, um, it is, uh, as uh, I think Jim might have mentioned, it is uh, the opening home opening week. Um, I believe we're currently undefeated at home. Is that, is that two, the stat where? Uh, two and oh. Yeah, two and oh. I think it's already more wins this year than last year. Let's go. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's good news. And I think that, um, you know, if Jeff's face is familiar to you, it's either because he's been on the news recently um, or because he's been a real big supporter of 10 at the top over the years. He's a current board member. He's a friend to the community. Um, he and his family are, um, you know, when you think of baseball in the upstate, you, you have to think of the drive. You have to think of the Brown family. Um, when you think of fantastic meeting space, you have to think about the third baseline and the, the room up, uh, up there where, where you guys have been so good about hosting many different uh, businesses, nonprofits, uh, anyone who needs meeting space in the area. Um, you are a, a huge supporter and proponent of downtown Greenville, the region, the community. Um, I myself have had uh, several birthday parties for my children at, uh, at your stadium. And, uh, and one of the highlights was uh, uh, one of my kids walking around the warning track uh, during a game when, when, when he played baseball. So um, big, big part of the community. Jeff, welcome to our, our chat chat. Thanks for being on today. No, thanks for, thanks for having me. I think you just took my whole presentation or uh, my whole talk. David, so, um, but no, I always, uh, thanks to Dean and David and everyone for the, the time. Um, I always kind of jump at the, at these opportunities to, to talk um, to folks, especially regionally focused groups. I know I've been part of 10 at the top for, gosh, I think six years, six years now. Our organization's been part for about 16, 17 years, but I personally have been on the board for the last six or seven. And um, it's just a, uh, you know, I, one of the, the the lines that I always lead with in in, in any type type of presentation or, or uh, speaking engagement is always that this is about a lot more than baseball. Um, it's kind of one of our our favorite lines. I mean, baseball is our our product. It's what happens on the field behind us, but really the magic of of um, of this place and the ballpark and the community um, is everything that happens inside the ballpark and what what the community really allows us to to do it, um, kind of treat the ballpark as a strategic asset to help advance kind of critical community initiatives and the like. And that's really, um, I think if you ask kind of dad in an honest moment, he thought this was a baseball business, you know, 17, 18 years ago. And it's, you know, now um, fast forward to today, it's it's about so much, much more than that. So we've got a couple of points that I'll, I'll kind of go through um, just to kind of bring you up to speed on the latest with with the drive and, and our business and floor field and what's going on. And then a few pictures that I think Justine will put up towards the end um, just to kind of highlight all that's going on around us, which is pretty staggering at the moment, trying to keep up with all the development in and around the, the ballpark. And then um, always love to kind of have people's reaction and questions at the end if that um, you know, it feels like a good good flow to flow to folks. Um, but yeah, David said it. I mean, we just kicked off. Opening night was on Tuesday. Um, uh, Tuesday night, it's our seventeenth seventeenth um, season, eighteenth year, but seventeenth baseball season because of our COVID canceled year back in back in twenty twenty. But um, you know, our seventeenth season of of dry baseball um, and opening day. Uh, you know, for us is. Um, you know, it's, you know, as a former baseball player, athlete and the like, you know, there's something about opening day that was just kind of a rite of passage, you know, spring and summer are here, um, you know, 17th season in the community. It's always awesome for us to kind of open the gates and welcome everyone back to the ballpark. And it was a, um, you know, a pretty awesome night just to, uh, you know, bring, bring baseball back to the, back to the community and kind of have a, um, you know, a symbol of, uh, of you know being being back for our, our 17th year starting on Tuesday and um you know when, when you boil down what we what we do as a platform I mean there's so many different events and and things that are going on every night um but we're really focused on um you know really community impact and economic development are the two kind of recurring themes whether that's you know the program of the game that you're coming to whether that's the groups that we're hosting the things that were initiatives that we're spotlighting or celebrating you know really kind of 
boils down to one of those two um, you know, those two areas for us. And it's really about m making memories. Really, we're trying to again. We always also one of my favorite lines is you know if we're doing our job, you know we don't own this platform. The community does. The region does. And we're hosting and celebrating things that are important to to this area and and the like. So. Um, you know, the qual the actual baseball part, I always do this and I get to the end and I haven't talked at all about baseball, which is kind of interesting. But the, uh, you know, the quality of baseball this year, we're actually more excited than we've ever been because of the, um, you know, we, we are a high A affiliate of the Red Sox. For those of you that, that don't know um, what that what that means, it's, you know, within the pecking order of minor league baseball, it goes in order A, double AA, A, triple A, and then the major leagues. So we're, we're high A. We actually have six of the top 30 uh, prospects within the Red Sox system. They're all based in Greenville right now, including the shortstop is actually the number one ranked prospect in all of Red Sox baseball. So he's, and he's about 18 and a half years old. So it kind of gives you some perspective as to how young these kids are too. Um, he was a high school senior last last spring. Um, but, uh, and he was, he's also, he's the number two ranked kid in all of minor league baseball. So, um, you know, really high level talent across the board in terms of, um, you know, the actual baseball part of the business, which is always, always fun. But, um, you know, from a business side of things, you know, so 17 years in the community, we're always focused again on continuous improvement and the fan experience and how we can make, you know, the memories that you know, people have at the ballpark make that um, as impactful as possible. And, um, you know, 17 years is a long time, so you can't uh, just rest on past success. You always have to you know, be, um, we always talk about kind of what's our new roller coaster this year, if any of you are, are amusement park fans. So we're always trying to debut new products, new experiences, new things that, uh, you know, people can look forward to um, when they come to Floor Field. I mean, this year, we tend to do this where we pack, we don't spread it out. We kind of pack so much new into one year and kind of overwhelm ourselves in terms of everything that we had to work on. But, um, you know, we have several new uh, kind of featured expansions of, of current partnerships that have, have added naming rights across the ballpark. We have a whole new plaza with with Milliken. That's been a long term partnership for, with us that we just expanded the um, the, um, the Milliken Plaza right off our new District 356 space is um, a really, really cool kind of all experience uh, kind of showcase for Milliken, Milliken products, Milliken products that are in baseball showcasing Milliken Associates, we have this really neat kind of digital first pitch experience where you simulate a first pitch into a big kind of TV screen and it pumps out, you know, velocity and RPMs and different metrics back to you. So again, um, trying to increase the, the fan experience, you know, AFL has taken over our, our Champions Club space, which is that's the meeting space that David mentioned earlier, 4,000 square foot um really high end you know great for baseball games but also from a year-round basis you know afl is a you know global leader in fiber optics and technology and connections and because of the connections that take place in that space it just made sense to bring them um in there you know budweiser is now uh you know take taking over a, one of our, our double suite areas kind of telling the story of budweiser and baseball and greenville and the upstate which is a really neat um kind of a really neat expansion of that partnership um we have a whole new, um, you know, part of the world of baseball right now is um, amenities on the player side, making sure that all the facilities across the country, I don't know if you've kind of read the news or some of the headlines over the last couple of years, but how minor league baseball players are treated has been kind of a, a hot button topic across the country. And you know, luckily the Greenville has always been used as an example of kind of how to properly treat the players with facilities and amenities. But um, there were a couple of things that, you know, 17 years ago, you just wouldn't have, have thought of when building a, a stadium. When you think of um, technology and data rooms and female locker rooms and, and female umpires and meeting spaces and the like. So we actually added um, um, several thousand square feet of, of square footage to our clubhouse to expand it, to add um, some new meeting spaces and areas, which actually, if you if you can visualize the ballpark, that's the clubhouse is on the right below our 500 club um, kind of outdoor sports bar area. So when we expanded the 500 club, we actually now have kind of a terrace on the top with the 500 club gaining some more square footage too, which has um, been really neat. Uh, we also are we're debuting a uh, an official beer of the Greenville Drive for the first time. Um, new Realm Brewery, an Atlanta-based brewery, has come to Greenville. Um, I'll get into that in a second, but as they're they're coming in across the street, we've been working with them for a couple of years on a partnership framework, and um, we're actually going to debut Rallyville Lager, or we debuted it this week, um, and the official beer of the Greenville Drive, which is a um, 
in partnership with with New Realm, which is a, a really neat um, Vienna lager for those beer enthusiasts that are on the phone. Again, just another a neat way to enhance the um, the fan experience. So again, all we can't rest on past success. We always have to add new things. We also always have to add new enhancements and new new um, the ways that we're making the experience at the ballpark more impactful. And it probably isn't a better example of of that than what we've done over the last uh, seven eight months, getting ready for this season. Um, but then also what's happening, and this is where, um, you know, Justine, if you want to put up those pictures, the kind of from a macro standpoint, um, what's happening around the, the ballpark, and this is always a good slide to start with, because this is 2006 versus 2022, um, exact same vantage point uh, from, a, from a visual standpoint. And um, that you can see that what's really happening um, and there's a lot more in play here than just the baseball stadium, so a lot more factors. But the fact that the the ballpark has been able to play such a central role, key role in the you know revitalization of um, you know the West End of Greenville and all the development that's happening in and around us, and um, the energy that's come to this part of town with um, the baseball center, the baseball stadium at the center. Of that in a lot of ways, this is this is where it's become really neat for us as we're. Um, you know, the magic still is what happens within the gates during the games and the like, but now you can really start to visualize all of the, you know, what's happening is there's really an entertainment district that's developing in and around the ballpark with floor field kind of anchoring it in the center, um, which is giving us really a, a lot of opportunity to um, you know, expand the business and really think creatively about how we can, um, you know, impact folks in all, all kinds of new and, and neat ways. So, the next um, the next couple slides, Justine, if you want to start clicking the um, the uh, this is just kind of an overview. And again, I, I mentioned it at the beginning. It's hard to keep up with all the development that's going um, on in and around the ballpark. It's it's and it's not all us, but we we try to say that you know if, if something's happening around us, we'd like to at least have a seat at the table so um, we can um, influence or have some type of influence on on what's happening. So it adds some type of value to the experience at, at Floor Field. So this is a overview and then we'll click through just some bigger pictures in a second, but just some of the featured featured projects that are happening, um, you know, around the ballpark, the the Fieldhouse building, which is the, the big office building behind left field, that if you can visualize that sitting in the stadium, um, that's, a, you know, that's our building. Uh, we moved our front office into that, that space back in 2017. And when we signed the um, the lease, we had a purchase option that we executed back in, in 2021. So um, that build, building is now fully integrated within the ballpark experience, the rooftop space that's on the top. Um, and then the, the featured part of that too is, and it's actually good timing because grand opening is tonight. Um, the Bellwether, which is our, our new restaurant that's open at the ground floor right uh, in the old Liberty Tap Room space. Um, I don't know if folks on the phone have have been to downtown Greenville recently. If you've been to Urban Wren, which is right around the corner um, from the ballpark, a really, uh, really good high-end fine dining restaurant in Markley Station. Um, the Lincoln family owns the owns the Wren, and they're actually from New Hampshire, huge Red Sox fans, and had good success with the Wren, and we're looking to expand the business um, into more of a communal family second restaurant option. So they're, they've opened or opening the Bellwether tonight. Um, and we're super excited about that space because now, I mean, they're fully integrated into the ballpark. So, um, you know, we're going to be able to make them better. They can make us better, you know, co-branded events, menu items, just all kinds of creative ways that we can work together to create a, a really kind of world-class experience there. Um, District 356, um, that's the whole field, old field street side of the stadium. So that's our kind of nod to Yawkey Way. I don't know if we have any Boston people on the phone, but... Fenway Park in, in Boston has a, a street right outside the stadium. Um, Yawkey Way is actually called Jersey Street now, but it's a, a street that they, um, you know, activate with live music and games and entertainment on on game nights and on a year-round basis. And um, the apartment building, 408 Jackson, that went up uh, a couple of years ago or started building a couple of years ago when we got wind of the, the new apartment that was going in, we started to work on this concept of developing the street between us and the apartment into this entertainment district, which was just completed in August. And, and we've officially rolled it out um, as part of this season. And it's been a really neat kind of entertainment extension of the ballpark that's going to be terrific for us. Um, 
I mentioned the player clubhouse, which is uh, a whole new few thousand square feet of um, of uh, you know, additional clubhouse space and allowed us to also expand the 500 club on top, which now you have a space in the 500 club that directly overlooks the um, that whole district 356 area, which is um, which is pretty neat too. Um, I'll show you the picture in a second, but there's also on the corner of Maine and Markley, they're, we're about to actually sign the, the closing documents in about an hour. Um, Suncap, uh, Suncap Development is, is building another um, kind of another mixed multifamily apartment complex on the corner um, where our parking lot is currently. And um, it's a, you know, a couple hundred units of multifamily, but the ground floor is kind of new retail space. There's a restaurant coming at the corner of of Maine and Markley. Um, and we're also going to uh, relocate our retail store into the ground floor of, of that space, about triple the size of that footprint, um, which is a desperately needed on, on our end of things. Um, and also have access to about 125 new parking spaces, which is also desperately needed in the West End. Um, so that's another new project that's coming. Uh, I mentioned New Realm. Um, they're actually moving there. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with New Realm, but again, another world-class operation both food and beer out of atlanta they're actually owned partially owned by um uh partners of the red sox so they identified greenville as a, a market that they were interested in we helped them kind of get acclimated to town and uh, they're moving into the site of the former old cigar warehouse right across the street they're actually breaking ground um in a couple weeks and uh, that'll be open at some point this summer um, and then there's also right across uh, from from New Realm, right down from uh, 400 Rhett, Rhett Street. There's a, this is the most conceptual um, conceptual new project in the area, but there's a, a group that's trying to bring an outdoor kind of small venue, music venue um, into the space uh, for their their background is um, Hard Rock Cafe and House of Blues. And, and then they were purchased by Live Nation, but they're trying to bring a kind of an outdoor music venue space into the West End too. So there's there's a ton here. The next few slides are just pictures of a lot of these projects. So just, you know, I don't know if you want to just click through and show some more visuals. This is the District 356 space. Um, these are actually from the end of last season when we were just kind of getting things done. You know, we've had three games, two games so far this season. We had a, a massive opening night um, where we debuted Millican Plaza and fully activated the street as part of that, which was awesome. We had a big health careers night last night where we had a big community health fair on the street, which was amazing. Um, we're gonna debut a new Saturday product, Saturdays on the district, where a couple hours before every Saturday game, we're gonna have live music and entertainment and food trucks. And um, again, if you have a ticket to the game, it's just kind of a, a way to entertain people before they get into the ballpark, but it's just giving us so much more real estate to be creative. Um, and be impactful in terms of the entertainment experience. Um, this is a this is a look at the the new clubhouse, which is almost done at this point, because um, the players are actually in it, so it had to be done. But you can see how it's you know naturally integrated into the existing footprint. You really can't tell kind of new versus old construction. But we had to add, um, you know, about two thousand three thousand square feet of space to add some of the new. Um, add some of the new rooms and uh, kind of reconfigure some of the new needs for the players and the like. And also gave us, as we pulled the the footprint out towards the street, it gave us that chance to expand the 500 club at the top level too, um, which is really neat. And then this, this is shots of the bellwether. Again, you can come tonight and see the actual thing, but these are the actual renderings from um, a few months ago. It's a, again, it's amazing. Um, we never had a great relationship with Liberty Taproom. They were never, um, I mean, they they kind of rolled through GMs every year and um, we always were trying to have a bigger relationship and do some fun things and we could just never um, get that off the ground. So we were super excited to work with the Lincolns and, and the Bellwether. And, um, you know, it's a food led concept, but it's a, uh, I get they they get offended if I call it a sports bar, but it is it is to me it's a sports bar led by food with good beer, more family friendly, accessible, very communal. Um, that top right shot that's the back patio, so that huge TV that's actually up against the Green Monster if you can visualize that. Um, so if you think like Yeehaw Brewery and that massive TV that they have outdoors um, in their space, that's our version of that outside. Um, so again, just to create another gathering spot area for the community to get together, whether it's year round, before a game, during a game. Okay.
keep clicking, Justine. This is a shot of the New Realm space. So again, that if you think top right, that that existing building, that's the old Scar Warehouse. So they they're bringing in about a you know thirteen thousand square foot or twelve thousand square foot you know facility to um, kind of totally transform the um, the old Scar Warehouse place from a from a, um, a brewery and a restaurant standpoint. And they've got the whole outdoor space to the right that they're going to activate in a communal way and um have a have a music stage a gathering spot um kind of the whole like everything that's kind of all together in that one space and again this is directly across the street from the ballpark so um again another entertainment enhancement for the area that's just going to bring people together i mentioned uh, this kind of this gives you a, a feel for the true scale so this is the new um suncap building that's right at the corner of main and markley where our parking lot is currently um again they're breaking ground next week and um it's a again multi-family you know apartment at, at the top level but at the ground floor um you know restaurant at the corner some new retail space that build uh, that uh, shot on the on the right that has the arched windows so that's that's our new drive retail store so we're basically taking our retail store moving it across the street into this space and then you can see the parking garage where we have about 125 parking spots they're going to come with this building that we have access to as well. So again, another, um, the scale of this building is really gonna transform that corner and then also just making sure that it's adding some value to what we're doing on our side of the street as well. And then the last page, again, this is the most conceptual um, of the different projects that are happening around us, but this is the outdoor music venue. Um, the the green, the, the grass area in the top left, that's the, side of new realm that you just saw on the previous slide so you can see where the the music venue is going in relation to um to where new realm is going and um the guys that founded this like i said they're they worked in senior leadership at hard rock cafe then they went and founded house of blues which was then bought by live nation so they have good kind of restaurant entertainment um concert experience and the concept is to bring not like huge arena shows but to bring live music and, and good food into one kind of intimate setting um and again, this is going to go in pretty much right across the street from the ballpark. Um, but again, most conceptual at this point. But again, the way that we uh, you know, view, I think that's the last slide, but the way that we view all of um, these projects, and I just like to go through them quickly. I mean, one, to show just the amount of development that's going on around us. And, um, you know, we love it. I mean, we don't view this as competition. We view this as bringing energy and um, liveliness and activity and um just buzz to the whole, not just Greenville, but to the whole community, to the whole upstate in a lot of ways, and to have it be around the ballpark and to be able to work with these different groups and to figure out ways we can add value. We just think it's a, a great thing for the the community and a great thing to um, to see this whole this whole area kind of picking up as as it is. So I think the I think those were the main things that I, I wanted to touch on. Just again, my, mainly just seasons off and running as a Tuesday. Um, you know, our 17th, 17th season, we're super excited. Obviously, the only, this only works with the, you know, support of the community. So there's a huge element of gratitude and appreciation as we, um, you know, bring baseball back and saying thank you to everyone that continues to support us, but then also hopefully showing that we never take that support for granted. And we're always trying to find new creative ways to add value and make sure that this is a facility that everybody is proud of in the upstate and we we have different you know experiences for for everybody um but that's all so I Jeff do. um that is awesome and thank you so much um you know it's interesting I was not here in 2006 so I uh that first picture that you showed of of what it looked like in 2006 and what it does today is just striking I I am amazed by uh, the difference there. A um, couple points, I'd, uh, and we have a couple questions in the chat too, but uh, just to start with, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, a lot of the the, the work, uh, some of it at least related to the, the uh, players and the new clubhouse and everything. I don't know, I had to step out for a minute, so I don't know if I missed, if you talked about that y'all had to put padding around the outfield uh, to, yeah. to accommodate with Major League Baseball. Can you talk a little bit about kind of that uh, change of of the standards for all the parks now? And I'm sure you guys had to do a lot less than some other parks, but obviously uh, you have had to 
to do a few things to make sure that you're um, in line with what the expectations now are for facilities? Yeah, no, I, I was going through before this kind of what projects to talk about. I couldn't talk about everything and I wasn't sure if people were going to think that outfield wall padding was the most exciting thing to talk about. But honestly, that was one of my favorite projects that we worked on. Um, we've always had a nice clean look in the outfield versus some other minor league places. We've, we've got to, you know, we've always emphasized quality over quantity when it comes to our high visibility partnerships, but it's been, it's always been a little bit random in terms of how things are organized. So we did have a, there was a rule that kind of forced us to, we had to add padding to all of our out across the entire outfield. Um, and, and uh, as part of some of the new minor league facility rules. And as part of that addition, it gave us a chance to rethink and reconfigure how we laid out our, our outfield wall from a partner signage standpoint, which I, I loved it. I mean, it, you, you show up and it seems like a simple project. It took us about nine months to, to get to that point in terms of different layouts, different configurations, talking to each partner, making sure everyone's comfortable with the layout and the look and everything. And I, I love how it turned out. I think it's impactful and clean and organized. And, and I love it. But um, I mean, Dean, to your point about, and I'm not sure how like the level of familiarity with everybody on the call, just in terms of our, our business, but um, and I, we don't, the part that's interesting, I think to some is we don't control anything with the players. So, I mean, that's all Red Sox, like the Red Sox, we have our, our, our business is about partnerships and relationships and our Red Sox partnership is the most critical because if we don't have that, we don't have a baseball business, but um, in terms of the players, the roster, um, the coaches, the managers, uh, you know, who's here on the team, who gets called up, who gets sent down. I and mean, we, we have no control over that. That's all Red Sox controlled. Um, and our job is to, is, is to, we, we try to say to the players, we want your experience at floor field and in Greenville to be your best experience in baseball until you get to your, your, your locker in front of Fenway park or whatever pro team, um, you know, you end up making it with, but our business, you know, we're in the business of uh, filling the seats. You know, we're an entertainment, you know, an entertainment, a community event, entertainment property. And, you know, so we're, you know, sponsorships and tickets and events and, and the like, that's our, that's our business. So, um, but it, it's a, so it's a critical part to make sure that the players have a, um, you know, their experience here is, is top notch, but at the same time, we don't control the players at all. So that's probably, that's why you don't see us lead with a lot of like players in our marketing and advertising as well, either. If you're ever curious about that, because we, they could be gone tomorrow. Like we don't control whether they're, you know, they could get promoted, they could get cut, um, that whole thing. So sometimes we'll weave in some player things, but for the most part, we focus more on the event side of the, of the business. Well, my favorite, um, uh, promotion that I've seen a team do that does relate to the players was last year when um, the San Diego Padres traded basically half of their minor leagues to get, uh, you know, Juan Soto. And I remember one of their teams had, a, you know, had lost several players. And so they their promotion for that night was bring your glove. We might need you. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, and, but I do remember when Jan um, Mancato played um, his first games here a few years ago you guys really pushed on that and I'm sure uh it was before my time again but I, I believe when John Smoltz uh played uh a game here you guys promoted it so there are yeah. is the ability when there's a one-off or those kind of things but it certainly makes sense not to promote uh the players knowing that that they may be gone well, everyone everyone, re everyone remembers Jan because he showed up in a Lamborghini so that was what most people remember um <clears throat> But yeah, we we uh, we've had 111. I mean, that's always another interesting stat. 111 guys that have come through here that have gone on to play, not just in Boston, but in you know on a major league roster, um, you know across you know so across 17 or six, 16 seasons. We just started our 17th, so I mean, you can do the math that when you come out, three or four of the guys that you're watching um, are going to go are going to make it. They're going to be there. So um, the uh, I mean, especially this year too. I mean, we've got. Um, again, the kid playing short was the fourth. He was Marcelo Meyer. I mean, he was the fourth pick in the draft last year in June. So, I mean, I don't know if you follow drafts, but I mean, that's the the major league. That's all high school, all college players eligible. He was the fourth kid selected shortstop out of high school in San Diego. And, you know, Blaze Jordan's the third baseman. He was a second round pick. And Nick York, our second baseman, was the 17th pick in the 2017 draft. So there's about $40 million of signing bonus money in the infield right now. So, I mean, there's a 
the level of baseball is is very high. Absolutely. And one thing, um, and I want to get to a couple of the questions, but but one thing, you know, you you mentioned you don't control anything related to the players uh, in the team, but uh, what I like, and it's and you mentioned it with the new um, uh, outdoor area, is the that you guys have really been very intentional to um, uh, associate the park with uh, the Red Sox and with Fenway Park. You have the Green Monster. You mentioned the similarity to the Yawkey Way and things like that. And and you have now signed a, a 10 year agreement, so we know. You know, it, it will be a, a Red Sox affiliate for for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Talk just very briefly about when you're doing some of this work. How do you try to make sure that it does connect to uh, the Red Sox brand? Yeah, I mean, there's still um, it's a lot better now than it was 17 years ago um, because the Braves were here for 25 years out on Malden Road, and this is still Braves country in the South and the like, and we still get a couple people, a couple fans that I'll get into arguments with on the concourse because they they want the Braves here, not the Red Sox. But I mean, that becomes less and less every every season, um, mostly because I mean, people just I mean, we the Red Sox I would argue are one of the high like the most visible high class brands in all of sports. I mean, they do things the right way. They invest in their players, they invest in their facilities, they invest in their um, affiliates, and they they know if they invest in the process of their of player development that they're gonna. Um, you know, they're going to realize the benefits when the, you know, two, three, four years down the line when these kids get in, get to Fenway and get to Boston. So, I mean, the process, you're right that during, right during COVID, um, it used to be that um, there was a two or four year kind of legal document that um, connected the minor league team to the major league club and that there was a, a you know, a um, an understanding that it would be an independent business in the minor leagues and the major league club would provide the players and pay the players and the like, and we would provide the business. And um, that changed. We were, we were two separate, totally separate entities. You had minor league baseball with the front office in St. Petersburg, Florida, and a whole staff of 50. Um, then you had major league baseball over here with the commissioner and, you know, sixth Avenue in New York city and kind of operated over here. And they were connected by a document that said, again, these would be independent run minor league businesses and the major league would major league guys would provide the players and that's how it was connected together. Each major league club had a different number of affiliates, different number of teams. Um, and back in right in 2020 is when it was all standardized. So we all became part of the same organization. We're now all part of major league baseball. We all report out of, of, of uh, New York and the major league baseball organization. There's no longer a minor league um, commissioner, minor league baseball like front office staff in Florida. That was all, eliminated and they standardized the number of affiliates you know there's 30 major league baseball teams and each of the 30 teams has four affiliated minor league baseball teams now um, low a high a double a triple a so there's the same amount of affiliates per um, major league club and the like and part of that process too is so there were 42 teams minor league baseball teams in 2020 that were eliminated they lost their affiliation and big cities too i mean knoxville um Twin Cities in Minnesota. I mean, there were there were a couple of them. There were some angry, angry cities and the like. So, but we were, you know, we we hung our hat on our Red Sox relationship. And um, you know, they they've been unbelievable partners for um 17 years, 18 years. And you're right, it's extended. We did we extended it in 2020 for another decade. So it goes through 2030. And you know, we've we've um you know, they've just been unbelievable to work with. So let me uh, do a couple of these questions real quick. Uh, the first one, and I think I, I know the answer, but I'll let you ask. Um, do do you all do fundraisers for local nonprofits? And I will say that I have spent a good number of Sunday afternoons um, uh, distributing uh, beer and boiled peanuts to people uh, as a fundraiser for my son's uh, uh, band, the Riverside High School Band. So I know that's one way that you guys do work with local nonprofits, but how, um, you know, what are ways that or that uh, nonprofits can work with you uh, in a fundraising capacity? Yeah, I mean, the best way is just send me an email. And I mean, we do all kinds of things from whether it's awareness building or concourse tables, or if you have content that you want to try to integrate into the game that we can help you amplify, or if you want to 
post your your board or your leaders or your beneficiaries at an event space or you just want to have tickets to a game i mean there's there's all kinds of i mean i think we i think we work with pretty much every nonprofit organization community organization in the in the upstate in one way or another uh, um in some capacity so i mean i i always like to i mean the whole business is built on relationships so i'd love to if there's an interest or some way we can help i mean it always starts with a note or a phone call and um we'd love to you know, plug in as best we can. And you can put your contact information in the chat before uh, you leave too, Jeff. Okay. Um, there's a question about the timeline for the New Realm Brewery. When is that space supposed to be uh, ready? Yeah, so they actually break ground on Monday um, right across the street. And the goal is they want to be open before the summer's over. So, um, you know, construction is what construction is, but the goal is to get it open when our, but during the season. So we'll see what what happens, but it's it's coming soon. Cool. And then, um, you know, uh, a comment slash question about uh, that you guys have uh, are integrating more Hispanic entertainment into your programming. You you have, as is the case with many um, uh, teams in baseball, a lot of Hispanic players. And how have you guys worked with the Hispanic community to, uh, you know, because because um, that market loves baseball, always yeah. has. Well, so was, how have you integrated that here in uh, the upstate? Yeah, it's it, it's really interesting um, because I, uh, you know, baseball has always had an interesting dynamic with the Hispanic community because there's about, it's about 40% of the players are, are Latin or Hispanic by background, but it's about five to 6% of minor league baseball fans. So there's always been this huge disconnect between the product on the field and then the, who's in the stands. So um, it was about four or five years ago that minor league baseball created a um, kind of Hispanic outreach program specifically strategically called the Copa program that we um, have executed locally in Greenville the last couple of years. Have, we have two or three Copa nights during the drive season where we actually rebrand where the, the Ronis de Rio um, the river frogs the uh, and have a um, kind of a whole Hispanic cultural celebration. It's actually going to go um, – to a different level this year. I've been working with um, AHAM and um, the Hispanic Alliance and, and uh, um, Adela and, and Janeth a good amount the last few months because uh, we had the Hispanic Cultural Festival here on a non-game day in the fall last year, and it was an unbelievable success. And um, you know, Janeth agreed to be kind of my sounding board for COPA planning this year. So we've got three COPA nights on our, our drive calendar this summer that um, – we're really going to take that Hispanic cultural celebration to a new level this year with, um, you know, game content and what you see on the field and concourse kind of um, showing different uh, Hispanic led businesses. And um, I've even learned about there's an event through Upstate International called the Salsa at Sunset event. That's this really popular um, kind of dance event that we're going to try to bring um we're going to try to bring and integrate in some way. I'm not exactly, I don't want to overpromise because I don't exactly know how that's going to work yet, but apparently it was an incredibly successful event that they had down at Camperdown last summer. Um, but really the cool, the, the neat part for us is we've, we've, we've opened the door and had, are having these conversations with, um, you know, different organizations that have a lot more knowledge than we do. And we're kind of letting them lead us in terms of, okay, we've got these nights to celebrate um, this specific group, this specific community, kind of what can we do that's, um, you know, most meaningful. Um, so we're excited. We've, we've been so we've, we've had our Copa nights for the last three or four years, but I would argue that what you see this year with Copa is going to be much more intentional, meaningful, impactful. Awesome. Well, as you said, you know, it really is a, a community entertainment venue. My kids have had proms and uh, uh, homecoming dances there and, you know, all kinds of other events. Certainly you guys do races and I mean, it really has become a a, a great venue for uh, the upstate and uh, you guys are, uh, as Mayor Roberts likes to say, the upstate's uh, baseball team. So Jeff, again, thank you very much. I uh, much prefer having you on when uh, we can talk about uh, baseball and the stadium and all those than in 2020 when we had to talk about not having all of that. So uh, th this conversation is certainly uh, a whole lot more fun than we did uh, have several years ago. We, we couldn't agree more. <laughs> so uh, go out and see the drive. Um, uh, Erica, if you could put the schedule for the drive or the link to their website in the 
chat, uh, then people can check that out. And Jeff, if you can put your um, your email address for anybody who wants to uh, reach out to you uh, as well. So um, Justine, if um, if you can uh, put the slide up for the Upstate um, Team Up uh, to Clean Up event, uh, we are really excited uh, about this event coming up uh, next Friday, April 21st. Uh, uh, Amanda Munyon, who is uh, uh, the president of the Lawrence County Chamber and also um, a board member of Ten at the Top, uh, is uh, the uh, chair for our outreach, board outreach and community outreach efforts. And um, we wanted to do something that provided an opportunity for all of our board members to volunteer and engage, but also to be part of the greater upstate community and not to be something that we necessarily had to own. And so uh, in Lawrence County, as in many others, they have a, um, a, a community beautification effort. And um, actually last year we had one of our upstate connects that we partner with the Urban League uh, for on a community uh, litter pickup and uh, several of the directors from the different counties met in some cases for the first time uh, there. And so they started working together and came up with this idea of an upstate team, team up to clean up, which is around Earth Day. And so on Friday the 21st, we have five locations in the upstate in Anderson, Greenville, Greenwood, Lawrence, and um, Spartanburg, where um, our board members and funding partners and staff, and we encourage anyone else who is interested in joining us uh, can go out and uh, clean up uh, a particular uh, area of the community for an hour and a half, starting at 1030. And then we're going to have a Dutch treat lunch for anybody who wants to stick around and have some uh, fun and fellowship uh, with folks. So this is an open event. Uh, but, and we encourage anybody, you can participate in any of the five. Um, and even if you're uh, not able to participate in one of these, uh, Laura Hudson mentioned in Greenwood, and I know I uh, had a, a conversation with somebody in Abbeville uh, who's not able to be part of one of these, but is going to do their own cleanups. So certainly around Earth Day is a great time to do a community a litter pickup and cleanups. And we certainly would love to see you at one of these events on the 21st, but if not, uh, there are plenty of Earth Day and other activities as well. So um, uh, we will put make sure the links are in the chat. And if you're interested, you can reach out to, to me or Justine uh, for more details on this. So um, Justine, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you to uh, share our resource update. Righty, thank you very much. Rebecca, you are lucky today. We have some time. I won't be holding the gong out to to um, with the hook to pull you off the stage. So um, our resource update today, we have Rebecca Cunningham with Recess and she does have some slides. Let me pull those up. Just feel free to tell me when you're ready to go to the next one. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and share our program with all of you. And I would be remiss if I didn't say this was so interesting to hear Jeff talk because uh, the Greenville Drive has been an integral part of our program for years. We go every year and our participants love the experience every time we go. So that was really neat to, to have that connection with you today. Thank you. Recess is a signature program of the YMCA of Greenville. It started in 2013, and our, slo our slo slogan, sorry, couldn't get that word out, is a place for all, and it stands for recreation, education, community, exercise, social, and service. And the program serves post-high school adults with diverse abilities. You can go to the next slide. So the YMCA of Greenville has three pillars to all of its programs, and that is healthy living, youth development, and social responsibility. The recess program specifically falls under the, recess, the social responsibility pillar, but when we created the recess program, we decided that 
we wanted the adults that attended our program to continue to expand their growth and learn new opportunities to continue their independence and their living. So we added this fourth component to our program. Next slide. When recess started 10 years ago, we had five participants in one classroom at the Kane Halter Family YMCA in Greenville. And we have expanded our reach to now we have four classes in three different locations. We offer a class at the two different classes at the Kane Halter Family YMCA, which is downtown Greenville. We offer a class at the YMCA Program Center, which is in Simpsonville. And we also just opened a new site in January um, at our East Side Family YMCA in Taylor's. So participants can join the program that they are that they live in the community that they live in, so they don't have to drive a distance to be able to participate. Next slide. Some of our program highlights that we have at the Y that we really focus on. Of course, we have our our focus points, but just a few I wanted to share with you today of some community partnerships that we have um, would be our service opportunities that we give our participants. And we participate in, we have a partnership with the Ronald McDonald House once a month. One of our groups takes a small group there and they bake cookies for the families that are living in the house as a service opportunity. We also partner with the Habitat for Humanity Restore in Greenville. And we have two different classes that take groups there on a monthly basis. And they provide the sweat equity hours for those families that are in line for building new houses that need just the extra sweat equity hours that they could not provide on their own. We also um, focus on, again, independent learning, sk living skills and being able to learn and to grow. And so the picture on your bottom left corner is a picture of our Simpsonville class. They did a lesson on civic responsibility. They were taught what it means to vote, all of the impact of what voting does. They were uh, shown how to register to vote. They followed it up with a field trip to the Malden City Hall. And there they got to see the impact of how their votes affect their lo local community. And they also got to meet the mayor there as well. You can go to the next slide. So this is just a little infographic. I'm just gonna highlight a few things on there. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we started 10 years ago. We're celebrating our 10 year celebration this year. We're super excited. Um, we'll have a celebration later this fall, but 10 years is a big deal for us. And serving, going from five participants to we now serve 73 participants. I think one of the biggest stats that's impactful on this infographic is we have, our community has invested over $280,000 in our program because of the importance of it over the last 10 years. And we just finished our sixth competition in the Spring Games Special Olympics held at Furman. And we serve three communities, Greenville, Taylor's, and Simpsonville. Next slide. So trying to keep it short and sweet because <laughs> I was still, I had five minutes. So ways that you can get involved in our program. We love to have people come and volunteer and be hands-on in the program, especially when we have big events. We always need extra hands in the classroom. Uh, another way that you could uh, be involved in our program is we, out of the 73 participants that we have in our program, 70% of them receive financial assistance to attend the program. It is uh, paid privately through their families. And so that uh, gap for them is a huge barrier. And so if you are interested in sponsoring a participant to attend our program, that would be a way that you can get involved. The biggest barrier that we have toward growth in our program is funding, like most nonprofits. Uh, we are always looking for opportunities to partner with other organizations for fundraising or for opportunities for uh, grants that might fit our program style. So that, those are just some ways that you can get involved in our program. And 
that was all I had because I thought I only had five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you did. So we actually we actually had a um, someone who was unable to make it due to an emergency. So we're a little more relaxed today. Sure. Thanks, so Rebecca. You, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any questions about our program. Sure. And we'll see, we'll see if anyone has anything in the meantime, if you'd like to put your email into the chat in case anyone would like to get in, in touch with you, that would be great. Well, Rebecca, I would say we have the mayor from Simpsonville on here. So I'm sure he would be more than willing to, uh, to meet some of your folks uh, at some point too. Uh, uh, so you're not just, uh, and, and um, I'm not sure if GP's on, but we may have the mayor of Fountain Inn. So um, next time, maybe you'll have even more mayors uh, participate in your uh, government program. Thank you. Thank you. I'm we actually did get to go meet the mayor in Fountain Inn because he, uh, his father it works for our program. His dad is one of our uh, lead instructors. And so we were able to make that connection and we have met um, Mr. McClear in Fountain Inn as well. Well, see, this is just not fair. You can't leave out Simpsonville out of the Golden Strip. I mean, you know, come on. And I'm a <laughs> member at the Simpsonville Y, so I'd be happy to. Oh, to... we would love to make that connection. That would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there you go. All kinds of connections on here, David. Um, so, and Justine, um, the next tat chat is on the 10th of May, 11th, 11th of May, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And David, uh, we'll have David Clayton and an update on CUI car. So uh, always very good. And um, let's see. And tomorrow, uh, since we have a couple minutes, Justine, uh, tomorrow we will be at Tri-County Tech uh, along with the... Um, Urban League and others for our Upstate Connect, looking at uh, the value and importance of teachers in our uh, uh, workforce uh, here in the Upstate. So excited about that. And then, uh, of course, we'll have uh, the next Upstate Connect in May as well. So um, anything else, Justine, you wanted to, to share? And then we'll turn it over to David. I'm good. Thank you very much. All right. Well, David, uh, I was not sure, you know, last month when you were not on, uh, Todd did a great job and we ended a little bit early and we said, well, that's because, uh, um, you know, it was Todd's leadership. And I guess now you can uh, say the same thing uh, with um, the way we're going uh, for this month as well, but a great topic and a lot of uh, energy and a lot of good things going on. Yeah, I, I agree with you. What a great, uh, well, you really stacked up some great community uh, groups with with the Y and the Greenville Drive today, and um, it was a fantastic uh, hour. So, Jeff, thank you for being a part of it. Um, good luck to a great season. Let's, let's stay undefeated at home. And um, Rebecca, you know, all your work with the recess program there at the Y, I think everyone um, is, is probably just as is happy and excited for all the good things that the Y does that, that we are for, for Greenville Drive. So thanks for being on and, and sharing your message today too. So um, Dean shared when the next Tat Chat was, is, and uh, and who our speaker is. So it'll be good to hear what's going on over at CU ICAR. Um, to everyone else, thank you for being on. We see you next month. If we don't see you sooner at the uh, um, litter pickup on April 21st. So I hope everyone has a great rest of the rest of the day. Go drive. <laughs>